Good morning to everybody and to the session of infrastructure implementation risk management. So this morning we will be talking about infrastructure. My name is Guido Polucci. I'm a former program manager at EVAD and staff for the World Bank and so on. Now I retired, so I'm just an alumnus of the BRD. We spoke with all the BRD as a personal interest uh, for relations. And I thank very much the president, Betsy Nelson, for being here as a friend. A friend of our master in procurement, a friend in the BRD. And uh, so, uh, apart from this, I would like to start with a speaker. So. Caterina Nachton Biori, sorry, is representing the European Commission, so that means procurement all over the world. And she will have the speech on behalf of the European Commission. Then all over the BRD. Evgeny is uh, an associate director in procurement in EPP since the 90 years. So I leave now to Katarina Nato to introduce the session on infrastructure. Thank you, Katarina. Thank you very much for this introduction. Thank you all for being here. It's a great pleasure to speak at such a global conference. Uh, I tend to speak at conferences in member states where the representatives are either of the member state I speak or more European wide, but a conference with participants from Gaza, Albania, Kyrgyzstan, Montenegro is rather new to me. I will nonetheless focus on European public procurement policy in what I want to say. Lots of it, I think, is very well applicable globally. And if not, it's at least giving you, hopefully, food for thought. Um, if we think... Actually, today you have come from far and wide in the world, from Rome, from elsewhere. You will have come by plane, you will have come by rail, you will have come by road. And you will have experienced how our infrastructure is not up to scratch. It's either not there or it's failing. It needs, it needs updating. It needs up, upgrading to the world in which we live in. And we don't do that. Infrastructures, roads are rotting and not big enough. Schools, it's a picture from Bratis, from, from Slovakia. But this, in the meantime, the school has been renovated. But we have pictures of those from all over the world. I'm glad to have been a bit more global because the letter, last picture is a hospital infrastructure development in Canada, um, which also is a typical case of, of big infrastructure projects that, um, that have to be fulfilled. But we are not when we're talking infrastructure. We are not only talking big infrastructure projects. We are also talking about public services that most of us in Europe don't even think about. For some of you, that might be different. We just assume that there is water supply. We just assume there is wastewater management. And most of us assume that um, <coughs> the works. This is a picture, not so long ago, from, a, from an Italian newspaper. So it doesn't always work. And for all of that, you, as public authorities, if you are part of public authorities, you as service providers, you are responsible to help us provide the services that citizens expect and have a right to expect from us to be managed well. At the same time, dreams of grandeur of building the most beautiful airport that ever was in Europe can often turn into nightmares. Um, I'm German and I'm from Berlin and one of the infrastructure projects many of you might have heard of is an airport for the German capital city that was supposed to open in 2012. 
and that if we are very, very lucky, it might be opening next year. By that, so this dream turned into a nightmare of enormous proportions. We lost trust for citizens, we lost political capital, and they lost a lot of money. Both together is something we should all aim to avoid. Getting it right is too important, politically and economically. It was mentioned in the introduction that it's about 20% of global spend on procurement. We normally say it's about 14% of EU GDP spent of procurement. Whether it's 40, 50 or 20, in any case, it's an awful lot of economic activity. On we spend, as a European Union, about 50% of those funds we provide to member states to help them develop their societies and their infrastructure. This means that in the last what we call programming per period from 2014 to 2020, we have spent about 120 billion euro on infrastructure projects. And we want that those are managed from the procurement side in a way that they do not turn into nightmares. One possible consolation for us as procurement experts the problems of the Berlin airport are largely not procurement problems. But they could have been. There could have been much more also procurement issues. And in order to keep the trust of citizens to deliver the services we all need at the European Commission, we work, I work with all my colleagues, and we are quite a big team, we work on trying to help member states to get it right, member states and their contracting authorities. We also work on international procurement policy, but although I have a very international audience, that's not my subject today. But our basic principles of procurement policy might be of help to all of you. First of all, for us, procurement policy is an integral part of the single market. It's part of that idea of being one market in which goods, services, and people can flow freely. If procurement was not considered to be part of it, we would leave out 20% of our GDP out of this global, global, European integrated market. We are based on the idea of equal treatment of all big bidders around Europe. So we do not discriminate against certain bidders within the internal market and we do not discriminate in favour of certain actors. For example, things that are very well known in many parts of the um, of, um, of, of the world, like set-asides for small and medium-sized enterprises, are not part of the European policy framework. Because we believe in assisting SMEs to get access to the, um, to the global procurement markets. We do not believe in giving them a legally assured head start over other companies. We also believe that transparency is the very basis of a good procurement system. That's why our procurement publication portal is the one involving most procurement opportunities worldwide accessible to companies to bid on. Australia, a rather smaller country than the European Union members altogether, does not have, for example, a central procurement portal. If you want to bid for New South Wales contracts, you have to go on their procurement portal. If you want to bid for contracts in the Northern Territory, you have to go on their procurement portal. The US has a similarly completely segregated um, uh, e-procurement um, system. 
And we are proud of having an integrated system of transparency. And we believe that's incredibly important, amongst other things, to create accountability of public authorities towards the citizens of which we are part and which we are serving. It's on the basis of these principles that we develop policy initiatives. Let me start with the policy initiatives all over the procurement um, world, which also serve infrastructure procurement. They are not infrastructure procurement initiatives are separate initiatives. We have them. I will come to them in a minute. But we believe everything else we do also helps delivery of infrastructure. The first is, and that's you, we also believe in investing in people. We believe that's actually the most important thing we should do in the next years. We believe in capacity building. We believe in people who know what they are doing and they do it well. And they are trained to do it and they see a career in procurement. In Europe, that is often one of the most difficult things. You pass through procurement at the beginning of your career. And then you grow out of it, because procurement is only for those people who tick boxes somewhere on a, on a form. But this is what you try to get out of, but this is what we try to get the whole profession out of. Um, and this is what will make the procurement also of projects like the Berlin Airport more professional. We believe in procurement as a strategic of economic policy. So procurement is not a box ticking exercise. Procuring is not buying the cheapest in a mostly standardized way. We have to look at the fact that we provide the services we want citizens to have. We provide the roads, the railways, the hospitals, or the schools. And we have to take strategic decisions. Do we want them sustainable? Do we want them green? Do we actually want airports? Or don't we rather want more railways? All that is part of the political framework of taking the right procurement decisions. And it's especially important when we're talking infrastructure procurement. There will always be a need to buy pencils and paper or at least computers and tablets. But whether I buy, build an airport or whether I build a quick, a, a fast railway line, there might be a conflict of means and of available funds. So I will have to take the strategic decisions. And we believe that these strategic decisions should always be informed by sustainability criteria and by socially responsible procurement. Last and not least, what I call here procurement 4.0, what you will hear more about, the transparency aspect, the digitalization aspect. It's not, it's about giving companies the possibility to compete. It's about giving citizens the possibility to control. And it's about policy makers giving them the possibility to analyze data, to be able to make these choices, possibly between an airport and a railway. Without available data and usable and analyzable data, we will not bring procurement, we will not make procurement fit for the next 50 years. So we have, in all these areas, we have various policy initiatives to bring them forward. One, just on the professionalization issue, we are developing a European competency framework of what you should know, what skills you should have to be a good procurer, organization-wide and individually. And we hope to, be, to apply that all over Europe, that contracting authorities and member states take it over. But we will also work with OECD, who plan to bring our initiative 
two countries outside the European Union. They are in talks with Southern American countries, but also with countries on the Gulf Coast. It will help us build that community of practice that is global and not only local, national, or European. Infrastructure, very specifically, has also specific risks. They are not necessarily completely different or from other procurements. Also, if you buy pencils, you want to have them on time. But if they are light, the consequences are much less severe than if an airport is eight years late. So in infrastructure, we have much more interest in getting it right, in getting it on time, in getting it as planned, and at the price we have for <coughs> However, we all know that's often not the case. And one of the reasons is exactly the complexity of big infrastructure projects. So what can we do to mitigate these risks? Just more generally, it's not only focused on procurement. Well, take your time in planning. Planning, planning, planning. It's like buying a house. Location, location, location is everything. I will see what I agree with the next speaker that for infrastructure delivery, planning is what we have to do. And a bit more planning and adapt our planning. Otherwise, we never get it right. Unfortunately, all over the world, people often don't take the time because they think they don't have it. In terms of time, when did I start and when will you cut me off? <laughs> Just to know. Wow, well, that's not very really small. Good. Um, wonderful. Good. So, Take your time in planning and re-plan. Unfortunately, often people don't take it or don't have it. In Europe, one of the constraints is exactly our funding of infrastructure projects all over Europe. And that will apply all over the world for funded projects by institutions that help development. The money has to be spent by time X. At least it has to be committed by time Y. And if I'm not sure what I'm spending it on, in three weeks' time, I won't get it at all. That is difficult to reconcile with the necessity of well-planned projects. I've recently spoken to a working group of transport ministers of the European Council, where some of the member states that need a lot of help in developing infrastructure said. Their main issue is how can I do it fast so that I don't lose the money? And the representatives of really big infrastructure projects, for example, like what's called the Brenner Base Tunnel that links Austria and Italy through the mountains, say, well, it takes 20 years to plan before you actually start. And people who need a motorway from one main city to the next, they say, I don't have 20 years. So what do I do? And I do believe that's trying to square the circle. At least I don't have the magic solution to this conundrum. I do believe that more leniency and more acceptance that it does take time is important. I've also spoken lately to the responsible, uh, the responsible of the German government <coughs> for the development of our waterways. If you have the map a bit, in Germany doesn't have a lot of coastline, but it has quite a lot of internal 
waterways. And he had a procurement for those waterways. I am always told that in China it all goes much faster. Why do we take so long in Europe to build a new harbor, to upgrade a canal so that bigger boats can run on them? That brings me to the second point. Because we believe that it's important to get the buy-in of citizens. What I call the talk, talk, and talk again with citizens. Don't jump a big project on them. You risk at least there where you have review mechanisms, where you have activism, where you have protest mechanisms. You risk a lot of difficulties later. If you don't engage with the citizens you are actually building your infrastructure for, you set yourself up to fail. The earlier you do it, the better it is. Even if you feel it's a nuisance. You know very well that's needed. Why is there this bloody green person who wants to preserve that and that tree, or that and that plane that has always been there? No, the canal is going through it. It doesn't help. We all, well, most of us live in open societies with an open dialogue between citizens and government. Use it, don't avoid it. The next point is, know your market. If you do not engage with the market right from the start in a transparent and non-discriminatory way, Talk to what is out there, to the people who provide you what is out there, to the people who can tell you this will be out there in three years' time. Plan for that already. Then you also risk to build infrastructure that is not fit for purpose and not fit for the future. So Betsy said the most important thing of your master is the networking. In a way, the most important thing of procurement is networking. Knowing your market, knowing your customers, and trying to reconcile all their demands and wishes and needs. If you don't do that, you spend a lot of public money for nothing. And only then you can go down to the nuts and bolts of the procurement process. Only then you can decide what is actually my right procurement procedure. And we will hear much more of that from the next speaker. In any case, large infrastructure projects are never off the shelf. They are never the same as the one before. 20 new motorway kilometers are not the same as the 20 before. They always need agility and creativity and adaptation to the market. What have we done, and that's now very European and less global, but it might help others as well. We thought, hang on, when we come to what is the right procurement procedure, when we come to how do I engage with the market, then member states are often not sure that what they are doing will be compatible with the European framework. Also there, there are two possibilities. Well, I'm not sure that works with our basic principles of transparency, of accountability, of equal treatment. But I'd rather not ask anybody, they won't find out, and then I'll be fine. We think that risks problems like not engaging with citizens, not engaging with those who might have the power to stop you later. Who might say, well, that's really not what you should have done. Please stop and start your procurement in you. Uh, yeah, but I need the hospital actually right now. And it's true. And it doesn't feel good to the people who are there to enforce. And that's national courts, national um, supervisory authorities, 
but it might, as a last resort, also be my institution, the European Commission and the European Court of Justice, that might tell a contracting authority that did not work. You have done something that's blatantly illegal. And to avoid that, we have created what we call, rather heavily, a voluntary ex ante mechanism for large infrastructure projects, which contains a help desk, a notification mechanism, and was planned also to be a community of practice. In general, what, ha what, we, what has been shown since it was proposed to member states and adopted by the Commission about two years ago, it's the notification mechanism that has raised, has raised the highest interest of member states. So I will spend a few minutes on explaining what we do there. What are the issues that member states are not sure about? when they want to engage and not to hide, when they want to do something that's compatible with the framework but in the best way. What we have seen for large infrastructure projects, the questions have mostly been, is that a concession in legal terms? Or is that rather a normal contract? Do I just buy a service or a motorway? Or do I give it for the execution to a third party who is also having some of the economic risk. The delimitation between the two is not always easy to find. Under European legal framework, the law on it is quite different. So it's important to know. If I don't know, if I choose the wrong one with lesser uh, obligations, I might find myself at the end for the project that is incompatible with the national and European legal frameworks. I might be at the end of a contract, or I have to modify a contract to extend it. Can I do that? Or do I have to go anew transparently to the market? Because any change and extension of contract is by definition not transparent. It does not give a new opportunity to companies to bid and for citizens to control what we do. Can I do that or should I rather go to the market again? Another question that comes up, what type of private participation would I actually like to have and how do I realize it? There are two more questions than just asking is it a concession or is it a contract? For example, do I tender out the service or do I tender out the participation in, in a special purpose vehicle that is actually running the service? Is that different? Does that have different conditions under European law? And a very interesting point is cross-border cooperation. How do I deal with that? We have a European legal framework but it's a broad framework. So Italy has other procurement rules than Austria, but they build a tunnel together. How do they best do that? Do they take the best bits of everywhere? Also on this, there are legal rules, but in practice, there will be lots of questions. And it's there that we intend to help them. It's there that we really want to hands-on help them implement their infrastructure projects. And we do that by telling member states contracting authorities, come to us and ask us, is what you plan viable under law? Then we initiate a dialogue for the member state and uh, all the contracting authority. And we guarantee them a time frame that we will give them a comfort letter in case what they want to do or what we agree in the end to do is compatible with European law within a three month time period. I put the word comfort letter into little signs because legally we are the European Commission. It's only the European Court of Justice 
that is legally entitled to interpret European law. So if we tell a member state, yes, that's working, we believe you can do that, there can still be a competitor in the member state bringing it to court. It can still, from the court, come to the European court. And the European court can still tell us, you officials, you have been utterly wrong. That is illegal. But the likelihood is much less. So once somebody has come to us, we have found a solution that we think fulfills his aims of delivering the infrastructure in an efficient way, and our aim of it, and, and job to ensure that it's legally well done, then we believe it's not likely that it will be challenged successfully at um, European or national level. I mean, that is not guaranteed. For those who are, of you who are European, you might have followed the saga, again, my country, of European tolls and motorways. Italy has completely different problems with tolls and motorways than we have. But we try to have a toll for motorways. The Commission agreed with the German government on a scheme and the European Court of Justice said that's wrong. So it can happen. We cannot guarantee. That's why our comfort letter is right. a guarantee. Um, and in practice, we, we still started to implement and to bring our offer to the member states and their contracting authorities. But we have advised a few projects that are confidential, so we also grant confidentiality to those who want to talk to us. That's why there's just, an, just a question mark on a few of the projects we talked about. Only one of them has, made the, has been the subject also of a press announcement and press release. That's why it's got its own picture. It's the extension of the concession agreement for Athens Airport. Really part of um, putting Greece back on its feet, part of what we wanted to do, and part of what the Greeks implemented by extending the, extend the existing concession agreement. But lots of issues on procurement were unsure, and that's what we had to talk about and what we had to find a solution that satisfied the Greek authorities, the privatization fund, and us. So we believe we have already built a track record of successful projects on which we want to continue building. Wrapping up, in all of that, the public buyer and you other stakeholders Presenting control authorities or even companies, you are at the center of how we will perceive our societies in 20, 30, 40 years' time. How do we manage to make our societies more sustainable? How do we deal with the climate crisis, with the loss of biodiversity? How do we make our societies more partners? More, more partners of the different players than competitors all the time? How do we ensure the connectivity of citizens in the real world and the digital world? How do we do that right? Everybody talks about autonomous vehicles, and it's a bit as if it's something for you by Google. Well, in the end, it's for public authorities, because it needs infrastructure in the real world that makes it possible for autonomous vehicles to be there and it needs the money to invest in such infrastructures. And that where it all comes down to procurement again. Or our security as well is part of the picture. Is our security guaranteed by becoming more national? We had a clear plea of not becoming more national, of staying international and global. And I support it very much so. We are, the European Union, at the most open global procurement market. 
but we still have to see what we need to create a level playing field also internationally and to preserve our security and you also to preserve the security of your countries in a globalized context. <coughs> so, as the public buyer, you're at the heart of all that. Thank you very much. We are talking about infrastructure, in general terms, sustainable infrastructure, within Agenda 2030, with the other 17, in total, 17 uh, sustainable development goals. Just to let you know, I appreciate very much that you mentioned the people, investing in people, the social aspects, the totally, probably, have been disregarded also in our example for road, which is bad management, and I am very, very sad. <laughs> for the rest, uh, several, several other cases of non success in the world. The volume of sustainable infrastructure up to 2030, according to the statement of the, pres the new president of the World Bank, Mass, will be 4 trillion US dollars according to what he said in the sustainable development infrastructure, but we would have to add more, four billion for infrastructure resilience against risk and climate change risk. So what would be the responsibility, the policy is the major in the future? We would have to look at any aspect of the, the sustainable development goal, and when we are looking to the technical aspects of procurement for infrastructure, we are also to think about what we have done up to now. So the question, concession or contract, is a basic question, because concession means public-private partnership, probably you know, a contract is a public contract that uh, is used by the European Commission and the other relevant bank, with some variation, but the principles are all the same. And uh, you have the participation of the client, or you don't have the participation, you go to the process. I'm following this aspect as a transport engineer, obviously, and I have to tell to you that something should be changed. Katrina, you are right, as an expert of procurement and so on, so something should be changed in the approach of the private concession and the management by the client. So I thank you very much, Catalina, because the sequences of our presentation gives, in my opinion, the possibility to, um, uh, to the older people to request a lot of things. Unfortunately, some of the arguments would deserve a like uh, concession or contract, one section of person. Now I invite again to give you technical aspects of infrastructure. Thank you. Uh, sorry, okay. Two minutes. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Five minutes. Five minutes. I'm joking. Okay. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. Uh, okay. See? Just to wake you up, guys. He's the boss. <laughs> sorry. By the way, do you know that today there are more people living on Earth than have ever died? Just think of it. We have so many people now that never lived or died on Earth so far. Yet the global population is still growing and surging with tremendous pace. It's actually expected that by 2040 it will increase by further 25% which in physical terms mean another 2 billion people. More and more people are living in the cities nowadays, providing certain uh, extra opportunities for economic growth, at the same time taxing the existing infrastructure. The cost of providing infrastructure uh, was estimated recently by the Global Infrastructure Hub of G20. By that time, it required tremendous, I would say horrendous, 100 trillion US dollars to sustain, not to improve, just to maintain the living standards of people. 
this is tremendous figure, real big. And actually, if you think from other side, like the Great Wall of China, this huge figure consists of small blocks. These blocks are projects. And we at the BRD are very glad to support development of infrastructure by providing financing for that. So if you was about us, you know that we call it European, but in a sense, we actually global. We work in Asia, we work in Africa, and of course in Europe. It's not owned just by European countries, we own by countries from all around the globe. We have more than, uh, we have actually 70 uh, shareholders, 68 of those countries. As far as Australia, Mexico, it goes down to countries like China, European Union, and all the countries where we are creating. We are creating 38 countries providing uh, financing for the project, mainly private, but a lot of our finance going to the public sector. And we are very glad that uh, since we were conceived as the bank to help countries which were in the past socialist, uh, in the socialist camp and worked in the environment of central planned economies to help them in transition to the market-based economies and uh, multi-party democracies. Uh, to work on those projects, uh, we are supported by the policies which set out the principles of our operations. And when it comes to uh, projects, we have uh, fundamental four policies, uh, environmental and social policy, enforcement of policies and procedures which help us to prevent and fight corruption, as well as public procurement policy and the concession policy. And these policies are aligned with fundamental principles of good procurement, which are economy, efficiency, uh, equal treatment of all, transparency and accountability. And you know, those of you who are students that and had an opportunity to attend my lessons, I always draw this pyramid, which I call Smirnov's pyramid, just very, very easy to remember, which actually somehow show that procurement starts with very simple development because fundamental aim of any procurement, public, private, if you take 16th century or 22nd century, you will see that fundamental purpose of procurement is delivering goods, works and services to the beneficiaries. If it's public sector, we're talking about society. If it's private sector, uh, maybe also society, but also the private owners. By the way, here are the pictures of some project where the bank uh, was financing, and I'm very proud that I was involved in all of those, actually. I can just give you a little bit of personal touch. Here is a slide which I think is fundamentally, uh, uh, highlight the fundamentals of our approach. Indeed, as uh, Mrs. Knapkin-Fjordich said, uh, a lot of people consider procurement as box-ticking exercise. It's very unfortunate. It's compliance, but it's one of the culture, one of the school of thought existing in the world. But we're talking about global world, and in global world there are other school of thought. And for us, working at the BRD, we believe procurement is an art. It's, it's impossible uh, to deliver infrastructure, and actually modern, fashionable world is sustainable infrastructure. By the way, I might, when my daughter was 12 years old and just started senior school in England, uh, the school introduced the, uh, the subject which is called Sustainable Development Goals. And I was very much impressed that she was 12 years old. I just asked her, what, what does it mean? She said, oh, you know, we're talking about sustainability today, holding on to What does it mean? She said, in short, everything what is good is sustainable. I think it's a very good definition, actually, good for you. So I think sustainable infrastructure is good infrastructure. And, uh, of course, to deliver it, you need to see it much broader than just uh, following the procedure. That's one of the fundamental differences of the approach we take at the bank, where we focus on delivering results. We focus on the results. Many public procurement systems in the world, and I have the pleasure to coordinate policy dialogue with our country's operation, I see that, unfortunately, many uh, legal framework, many systems beyond legal framework in the countries are focused on compliance purely, on the process, not on the result. And as we discussed during the lectures, to become a good procurement specialist or expert in your field, you need to think of results. You need to do everything possible to deliver what is needed. And find a solution with it, progress bad of the regulations put by the people who probably never did any such projects themselves, unfortunately. 
And uh, procurement is not standard discipline. It is a fundamental part of the project implementation risk management. And of course, as any risk management, the first and most critical step is good planning. I fully agree with what was said. Because without properly planning your activities, investing in so-called well-prepared projects in terms of understanding all potential risks, where is the best way forward, understanding how to move projects forward, you will never uh, be able to deliver this plan. And very unfortunate, the, uh, in many countries, procurement seen as a very small uh, branch of public finance management. And as a result, while well, the budgeting cycle is limited to one year only, you cannot really build a sustainable, and I'm saying sustainable from capital S infrastructure, because if you slice it in a small portion, you will never get the best results possible. And in that respect, uh, project financing is one of the approaches uh, which we recommend to con uh, for countries to take when it comes to large infrastructure projects. I was quite uh, interested in the discussion which was uh, just pointed by uh, Ms. Captain Hurley about the, whether it's a concession, or a tender. You know, there's a very uh, well-known professor in public procurement in Europe, Sue Erisman from the uh, University of Nottingham. She once mentioned that from her perspective, we have to say I share her philosophy, probably this artificial demarcation lines when it comes to processes are secondary. At the end of the day, what we want and when it comes to any sort of public involvement, with a fair, transparent, and competitive process. So we probably do not, do not need to put demarcation line between the goods procurement, defense procurement, concession procurement. What we need to have a good toolbox of different instruments, which professional procurement officer, and officer probably is uh, too small world to describe what you need to know and actually when of you know that the RD supports that particular course because it involves different disciplines. It involves economics, law, engineering, psychology, a bit of everything because that's what you need to, uh, to know to be a good uh, project manager because procurement specialist or procurement expert specialist, again, to small world program, uh, you need to understand almost all aspects of life and life is never black and white. Life is very colorful, very complex, and always challenges us with new discoveries on every day. I've been in procurement more than 25 years, but every day coming to work, I'm actually eager and, and quite keen to embrace new challenges, which real life brings every day. But what's also important is uh, that, uh, unfortunately, a lot of public procurement system focusing on the uh, selection process only. Very few legal frameworks in the world really provide for comprehensive start to finish or start to end procurement cycle which uh, uh, initiates at the, with the project initiation and ends up with the end of life cycle of the project. Uh, as a result, the balance of risks very often shifted towards just selection. And selection very often is very subjective. We talk about different principles. And even principles can be deployed in different ways. For example, so-called meat. It's nothing to do with something you eat. So, so vegetarians should not be offended. It's most kind of advanced standards, you know. And uh, even that principle applies in different ways. If you go to you, very often it's very point-based. And then the question is how many points and percentages and weights you allocate between different factors. But it's all subjective. It's all arbitrary set by people. It's our bank. We really look at it in a more straightforward, monetary-based way. We believe that all factors can be expressed in monetary terms. But it doesn't mean you have to buy the cheapest product. It just means that you need to take into account the full life cycle cost, calculated using net present value or IRR. That's how we, as bankers, take decision of will we'll finance or not finance the project. We will see whether it's bring economic or financial or both benefits to the beneficiaries or not. And actually, none of the arbitrary set factors would ever achieve what the proper monetary calculations with net present value adjustment will give to you in terms of economically justified decision. You may argue, of course, there are factors which are very difficult to express in terms of uh, quality, that's the usual argument, 
But in reality, quality shows itself through life cycle. Do you need to invest more in maintenance and operation, or less? How often your equipment is broken? When you need to do major overhaul? When you need to update it? it many of that things can be taken into account. It's more challenging when it comes to innovation procurement, but still doable. Uh, that our uh, experience shows we can do it. As was mentioned today, you may have the best systems in the world, the best legal uh, regulations and framework, but people are key to success. That's another reason why we support this program, because we can help countries to draft best possible laws, best possible uh, procedures, help to develop digitalized systems, but success of any project is down to people. And we help or try to help our clients on this complex and difficult path, especially when it comes to unique projects. And many of our clients face major infrastructure development once in their working life uh, time. Because not every day you build a big bridge like other bridge in Belgrade or the uh, largest environmental project in Europe like uh, we financed in 2005 South Wales was a recent treatment plant in St. Petersburg or flood protection barrier there. So it's very, it's quite unique projects and uh, we at Bank are very lucky to have uh, highly qualified people who may help you when you engage in that type of projects. We also pay a lot of attention to preventing and fighting corruption in capitalism because we see corruption as a shadow tool in economies in our countries. And it's not only uh, erode uh, the economics and uh, financial side, it also erodes the moral of people, which are most difficult to manage. Uh, so, just to illustrate that uh, applying our Approach. Last year, our clients placed around 300 contracts for almost 3 billion. It's not a huge figure on the scale of Europe, but many of the countries you represent, uh, I think you would be quite impressed. For example, if you take Kyrgyzstan, I think the annual procurement uh, spending in Kyrgyzstan is about 2 billion euro if you calculate using the current kind of exchange rate. So it's, it's quite an impressive uh, figure, and I have to say uh, that we achieved it applying. Um, the principles I just described. So we're putting money where our mouth is, so to speak. But here is, in brief, a very simple description of the process when it comes to open tendering in practice. And every one of you, I'm sure, know that because in all countries are, who are represented here, you have very similar, not the same process. But I personally believe it's too simplistic for a complex infrastructure. We like some, uh, something which is much closer to the competitive dialogue within the European context. When the market and uh, public sector talk to each other, when this ecological model of discussion rises to the level from adult to child, as usually we can see in our countries, when state dictates and uh, bureaucrats says that how shall be done, we change the situation, we change the balance. We talk about real equality when the market and purchaser see themselves as equals and they talk to each other and as a result of this discussion they develop uh, through this dialogue and interaction and iterations uh, develop the most uh, balanced uh, way forward including tenure process and contract conditions which are most critical and of course uh, one need to estimate the risk, uh, risks of the project to do things properly and uh, consider this risk, unlocking this risk in the most appropriate way. That, that many of you know this diagram, is the topological scheme, how different parts of the process of project presentation and documents are interlinked. That, as you know, there is a presenter's dilemma, and psychologists believe that our brain process image 60 times faster than text. So to describe that, you would need to, to listen for me for much more time. So here you remember it forever. Uh, as any project, it uh, requires to find the Pareto optimal combination of three key parameters. Quality, scope, time, money. And uh, whatever we do, unfortunately, all our projects will be prone to cost and time overrun. There was an interesting study by uh, McKenzie undertaken a few years ago when they found out 
with 95% of work of the largest infrastructure project had a time overrun of more than 24 months and cost of overrun more than 20%. So it's absolutely normal. So you need to have a mechanism how to handle it. And for that, you need just to take into account again the external internal factors that influence any of your project or contract. And it shall be project specific, it shall be country specific, client specific, market specific, project specific, and country specific. So you need to be very, very careful when drafting the documents. And again, as you mentioned, some of you have seen the slide before. I am a firm believer from my practical experience that only equal partnership brings good results. Like in people's life, in business, a win win strategy is the best one to achieve results. As soon as you start unfair delegating and shifting the risk uh, to other parties, you will never get the results you want. And you need to take into account risks, and I will mention this word once and once again. And to help to mitigate these risks, there are different types of contracts developed by the industry which shall help you to uh, find the baseline of risk allocation. None of these form provides universal solution, but they give you a good skeleton to put your mid principle <laughs> to place. And uh, we and our clients very often work uh, using Philip. It's not only a form of contract we use, but in our region it's probably the most common form of contract. And we use all sorts of the rainbow Philip and our clients do it for every type of work, and we discuss in, in at different conferences, meeting with the industry, and the industry seems to like it, though there are certain developments in Philip which industry does not seem to be very keen to accept. For example, they used to say Philip suit of 1999, now they say 2017, it's called 4 kilos Philip, for example, because people believe that that how it should be measured. Not in the number of terms, but in terms of weight of the document. And here's the basic allocation of responsibilities and parties to the contract. As you know, I would not be stopping on that just to save time for questions and answers, but I would like to highlight that everyone should understand their role and do not interfere with the role of other parties to the project, to the contract or to the activity. We need to give people their position, their role, and find the right people to do their job and let them do this job. Don't try to micromanage them, to, put, to take on certain responsibilities which are not a necessary in the country, or shift on them something they're not prepared to take on. So contractor, of course, is a key player uh, to deliver. They are cheeky people and they try to get more money from you and do nothing. So for that you need some people to help and make sure you can use professional engineers and consultants to help you to balance contractors who of course show you a partner. Consider that you are sitting in the boat and rowing towards the finish line. By the way, does anyone know what is the sport where the winner passes the finish line with his back forward? Exactly, rowing. So be very careful. You need a good cox, you know, just to get to the right place. Uh, so, just uh, last two minutes, I will a bit fast forward in my presentation. I would like to highlight the key principles for drafting, contract drafting. And I really <coughs> want you to take it on. And uh, these principles are discussed in many conferences and uh, uh, would be considered and published uh, by some uh, international association of contracting consultants. And again, key point is, Allocate the risk to the party, which is a better fit to handle this particular risk. That's the fundamental principle when you're working on the projects and special infrastructure projects. And uh, try to obtain best value for money. Try to uh, keep the balance of risk unchanged for the contract. Philip reflected that in five golden principles, which have been published, actually, I think they promised to publish in July, I don't know if they published it or not, but I hope they do, and uh, I would like you to take it on, even if you don't use Philip, the principles reflected here are quite uh, important and need to be observed. So, on this note, I would like to give you a list of things where you learn more about the activities and campus operations, how to do things, and thank you very much. And I'd like to defer back to Guido, who would probably tell the question and answer session as planned.
so much say this is a car, the question and answer. First of all, I'd like to thank all participants from the shareholder countries of the DLD, from so many countries. I've seen also people from Libya, probably some of them from the DLD, and I see other people from other countries that are not in the DLD, so it's the sense of global. And uh, so I believe with uh, any of you, any questions, Katarina, into Evgeny, about this presentation about the infrastructure and uh, the implementation and the risk management from the principal and uh, to the technical aspect. Uh, I don't know. Uh, so a question to uh, Katarina. <coughs> you mentioned the objectives uh, the fundamental objectives of these uh, new initiatives and instruments uh, that we have. So here's a very specific question. How does the European Commission in this uh, system use and tries to accommodate perhaps the roads and belts initiative which of China, which tries to achieve some of the aims apparently that you uh, suggested? Thank you. As responsible for public procurement policy, I'm not responsible for international general policy, and I'm not responsible for expressing or even having an opinion on um, on the Belt and Road as a good, a neutral, or threatening initiative. I will not take position. Just. Being from Russia, I have this knowledge that you have an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> it may not be least. Always <laughs> happen. Uh, with respect to the RD, is very keen to support that initiative, and actually we believe in, cap in uh, global cooperation and the global gain from the capital G, as in the title of the conference. I know there's a great motto of task when you, you know, every little helps. So a lot of that is not that little, and definitely will help. And I, I, I believe that even you, though not, being, not representing the EU, I think it's actually, uh, I think also would, to a certain extent, support it, given that EU countries, many of EU countries are shareholders of Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. So they're sharing certain, uh, certain concepts and principles. And of course, there is concern uh, of the domination of Chinese contractors in the European market, and we can see that they're very keen to come. But maybe a little bit the situation that WTO GP accession by China has not been yet completed. It's a little bit, a little bit of uh, a gap as for European contractors to be ready to embrace the ch new challenges provided by very strong Chinese contractors. Yeah, thank you. And I, I have, I can compliment what I said before. That is indeed, there are an increasing number of Chinese investment in the European Union. Um, nonetheless, uh, the publicity they get as compared to the investments and the help that's provided by European structures, like uh, the European Regional Funds, the ACIF Fund and other funds, like financing to, uh, by, by the European Investment Bank and other structures, far outweighs any direct Chinese investment as a contractor or as a shareholder within Europe. And it's, it is mostly this European money that has helped building infrastructures all across Europe. We are welcoming investment, we are an open economy and we are welcoming investment from the whole of the world. I mentioned that the European procurement market is the most open procurement market in the world and we are very glad for Yevgeny. Yeah, that's exactly, I didn't know whether the V is actually, Yevgeny mentioned indeed, we are continuously working towards the accession of China to the government procurement agreement that will help 
level also the playing field and open up markets also in the other directions for uh, European, uh, com European companies in the Chinese procurement market that is much, clo much more closed than the European market. Uh, may I add a few words before asking another participant to the Professor of Nottingham about the Belt and Road Initiative that I've been following in the EBRT during the last five years. But by chance, as a transport engineer with the EBRT, I went to the Central Asia from 2000 and 2002. The Silk Road office has been created in 98 in Beijing, and I found a representative in the area because it was their interest. I prepared during those years the first report on all the railways of Central Asia. Now, what I can report to you from the recent uh, annual meeting of the BRD in Sarajevo, certainly uh, a request uh, not only to the BRD, to the multilateral development, but first of all to the BM Commission to strengthen the connectivity agenda, to strengthen the presence in the Balkans area. Because there is this sort of confrontation with China, of course, because China is doing investments, uh, and they pretend to use their rules and their companies, CCCC, the largest contractor, that they are using uh, uh, from Central Asia, they are using Africa, and so on, is a contractor on, uh, with a turnover of 90 billion euros each year. There is no comparison whatsoever with the contractors in Europe. So the Belt and Road Initiative is the economic belt that is extending from China to Europe, to Europe through uh, Russia, and the uh, uh, road is the maritime road, which means all the parts in the Indian Ocean, Djibouti, Piraeus, you are from Athens, some other ports, but the uh, Belt Road Initiative may change from time to time according to an enormous availability of funds. So I don't want to, to make now a statement, just my impression, which is a long impression since the year 2000, knowing also the Chinese history since 5,000 years. So the approach seems to be historical from the Chinese people. And we shall see, certainly the, the coordination is quite difficult between the initiatives, European Multilateral Development Bank, and the Belgian Road Initiative. Thanks a lot for pointing out this question. Just to put it, you know, quote from Lao Tzu, since we think about China, so the past and thousand smile past from the first step. I think this step has been done. So I think we will see this past to be covered. Other questions from uh, a yeah. My name is Jan Telgen. I'm a professor of public procurement in the Netherlands. I was interested by the advisory function, committee, establishment that the European Union is setting up for uh, infrastructure investments. Uh, but I was also a little bit surprised by a number of sentences that followed up on that uh, initiative, all stressing the fact that it was a legal check, checking against the rules, is it a concession, is it a, uh, a contract, all legal checks. And to my knowledge, not all, most of the problems arise not because of legal reasons, but because things should have been contracted in a different way, instead of one big project, making it several lots or whatsoever. So those are not legal checks, but they're sort of content checks. Is there any, any initiative in that way of assisting people in buying, or assisting countries in buying infrastructure, not in a legal way, but in a more economical or practical way? Uh, absolutely. I represent DG Grow, which is responsible for the public procurement policy and legal issues. 
um, practice, they eat, for example, Jaspers, a very well-staffed uh, advisory hub, mostly based in, in Luxembourg, together with the, with the EIB, which provides full advice on the whole cycle of, of, of procurement in terms of technical uh, choices, in terms of um, timing choices, etc. They do not provide advice on the legal side of procurement. So that's where we complement the advice that's available, especially via, um, uh, via the um, and Jaspers. The EIB itself, when it finances, gives advice on it. They also, but for example, it's the EIB, also in one of the projects we dealt with that came to us and said, can you sort of give the last, the last step of, of reassuring us and uh, the project owner that what we have in mind will work on the European law. Um, if that helps. A little bit but to compliment, it's like a, a BBC breakfast, and I have to no. already. <laughs> uh, okay. the, the BBC breakfast. <laughs> so, essentially, I would like to say that if you are involved and we cooperate a lot with the EU and European Commission and the IB, we co finance projects with private uh, banks and international uh, development uh, institutions. We are very glad to extend our hand of support and all our knowledge, practical knowledge on implementation exactly on the site you described. The site, how better to structure the project in the way most probably, again, because we talk about risks and probabilities, therefore, is quite a critical word, most probably will lead to good results. With everything in God's hands, we cannot guarantee 100%, but 99.9% we can. Thank you. Uh, Catherine and Evgeny, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. Uh, our students will know how to use it, I'm 100% I'm, I'm aware of. I will present myself at the end to make you understanding. Uh, but you succeed not to mention legal dispute, remedy system, and legal protection. Uh, how come? I'm Goran Matešić and I'm came, coming from a peer institution in Croatia. Oh, we have great faith in your institution. Um, because I delivered myself. I, I do, it was part of my first preparation. I do believe that remedies are and accountability, and it's part of the accountability issue, um, are incredibly important for all infrastructure projects. And I believe, I, I strongly believe in the possibilities of competitors to challenge procurement decisions at any stage of the procurement, even if they are often cited as issues that will delay projects, that will make it longer to um, uh, to to achieve. And uh, that uh, we often also hear the critique uh, that uh, complaints by competitors are only there to be bought out by the main contractor and that we should restrict the access to remedies. This is not our position. We believe they are an integral and absolutely necessary part of a rules based, legally insured, and accountable procurement system. That does not mean that does not mean that I don't agree with you that we should get away from that idea of compliance, compliance, compliance. And that's exactly and that's also something that's often said, oh I have fear of, 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 of complaints, so I only focus on the compliance issue. That's what we have to try to get away from by also giving all you, all the procurement professionals, enough to, to do their job well and to be sufficiently assured that they have done it well in legal, in economic, in delivery terms. But we are not going to achieve that by reducing the possibility of complaints. Um, I fully support that I think any balanced procurement system should have an impartial institution which will provide fair and I would say ensure the principle of national justice. Anglo-Saxon law. 
And in that respect, the BID has its independence system given our special status. But I also think it's important when we talk about procurement plans again not just to think about the selection process, which is an important step, but interim step, but also consider importance of dispute resolution during contract implementation and dispute prevention during contract implementation. I think we would have some presentation that regard that there is very there are very interesting approaches uh, developed so far by different institutions by a dispute review board, by ICC, FIDIC, or Bank ourselves. So uh, we consider it's very important. And just to avoid any misunderstanding, when uh, I was uh, suggesting that there are two fundamental schools of thought in uh, public procurement, or in any procurement, I'm not disregarding the importance of following the rules, because if there are no rules, I think we would be living in a very uh, difficult world of uh, legal, political, economic, and probably even physical channels. But uh, I'm here uh, focusing on what comes first, the priorities. And now I believe that the uh, purpose is to deliver infrastructure and solutions need to be found within the given process. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Jenny. I'm from the Philippines. I'm doing my PhD in law and institution at the University of Turin. So my question is actually based on, on some of the discussion. I'm now um, a consultant for the Supreme Court of the Philippines. I'm doing a review on the procurement mechanism on all the funded projects in China. And interestingly, <laughs> I think some of the issues there is that China is specifically mentioning the contractor in the agreement. So my question is like, of course, yes, you are right. Philippines and China are not members of GPA. But there's actually existing uh, foreign trade agreement with the Philippines and <laughs> some European countries. I think it was signed 2017. So my question is that, can we use that EFTA as a possible um, legal basis in questioning a particular agreement with my country <coughs> in China in terms of procurement, because there are so many integrity issues, social issues, and environmental issues that are being raised now in other funded projects in, in my country. I understand you correctly. The question is whether an investment or a, a, an agreement with China might be in contravention of a free trade agreement that the Philippines have, con have, con uh, have um, concluded with the EU. I have only for a short while been responsible of our international procurement relations. I was in no way, to be honest, involved in the FTA with the Philippines and its procurement chapter. So I cannot now tell you. Within the another question is how far might, might somebody in your country be able to evoke that before a national body that there is actually a violation of an international treaty between the EU and the Philippines, or is that something that's left to the international relations? Would it be up to us at the European Union to say, hang on, what the agreements that you have now to make with a third party are not compatible with the commitments you have taken towards us? And what's the dispute resolution mechanism then within this free trade agreement or does it, does it send us back to other dispute resolution mechanisms? This would all have to be looked at in, in, in more detail. In general, I would say it would be up to the other contracting part of the FTA, so us as the European Union, to say that something that, um, that um, the Philippines would be doing with third countries, um, for example, there might be a transparency obligation, so some kind of GPA similar rules on procurement in the FTA, and um, that would have had to be followed before signing this agreement with a third party. That's quite possible. Mm -hmm. And we have also general co uh, cooperative mechanisms then on reviewing the implementation of our FTAs in general. Just very really briefly, of course, one needs to understand limitations of certain agreements, and GPA in that respect uh, focused on particular aspects of, of foreign trade and opening the markets, but does not resolve uh, such issues as uh, corruption or social 
or environmental issues. There are other treaties in that respect, and the easiest way probably to resolve it, of course, when one day China will join this international number of international treaties. I, I, uh, I'm not an expert on their foreign uh, politics, and I sure don't know which uh, treaties they are a member of. But of course, if you will be members of that international treaties, as well as Philippines and China, it will be much easier to resolve. But currently, you probably have certain limitations in terms of resolution of these issues based on your agreement with them. Hello, good morning. My name is Remigio Strapinis. I am from the European Investment Bank. Thanks for very interesting presentations. And my question would be related uh, to uh, advisory report uh, mentioned by you in your presentation. Well, it's quite a recent incentive, I understand, but still, nevertheless, I suppose we've got already some experience how it operates. And my question would relate, does the level the number of approaches you receive from uh, various uh, con uh, contracting authorities, uh, does it meet your initial expectations? Do you see a need to put more resources in answering such questions or possibly to make it more uh, known to possible uh, interested parties to get, uh, to get that, uh, answers the Commission may provide? And and secondly, I wonder, actually, who can approach you with that question? Are they just contracting authorities or, for example, in the case of cross-border projects, they can be just uh, all parties together or together with co-financiers like EBRD, EAB and other entities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the questions. Um, Yes, uh, we believe that uh, the interest has met expectations. We have been very cautious when we proposed the mechanism and officially in the communication we issued at the end of 2017, we limited it to projects above 500 million euros in, in value. Um, having made an, an evaluation that if we were contacted by all potential projects each year, that would be the maximum we would can be able to handle. In retrospect, we've been too cautious, but we pitched it as really for the really big projects, which obviously on the other hand also have generally really good legal and technical advisors from elsewhere. Um, but we have seen, and we thought about new projects. What we have seen is that it's the projects that have approached us were often not new projects. I talked about the Athens Airport. The other projects were also rather projects of how do I carry on in the future with an infrastructure project that I've already started, that I'm already managing. Um, and now that has changed a bit the focus of what we were thinking of at the beginning. Um, we have, um, we, we type three, we have, we have a relatively small, completely dedicated team to that, but in the whole of the directors we have about 60 colleagues with all their expertise on specific countries and specific legal issues that we draw together and where we will then work in a team with the country specialist, the specialist on concessions, it might be the specialist on, on remedy systems, etc. To bring that together, we believe for the time being that is the right approach, instead of creating something that's completely separate and tries to integrate all that expertise. Um, in terms of communication, yes. And that's one of the reasons I'm here. I'm speaking about it whenever I can. And uh, we are building on those people who have been, who have contacted and said it's a good idea. Um, we have left it, to your last question, deliberately open who can contact us. And in a way, it's up to member states to also to decide potentially, no, you cannot. Um, we had some member states say, oh, well, we want to centralise that. No, 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 we don't want sort of the European Commission interfering in our internal processes. Exactly one of those member states 
we then had, and no legislation has been done by any member state as far as I know, we actually had a local contracting authority with a very big project who came to contact us. And they found it, and that possibly also coming to your question again, a very interesting contact in fighting for political support for the way they wanted to manage the project. So that transcends the pure legal question. They had the idea that that would be the best delivery model, and they had quite a few politicians say, no, we should do it this way, and we've always done it that way. And, and getting, getting from us the reassurance that that's the way forward that is useful, and that's how it should be structured was very helpful to, to them. And like all um, days, I can't translate that from my language, but all good things take a while. Two, two brief questions to our two speakers. One relates to uh, Evgeny's daughter. Uh, she says that sustainable is good. So the question to me here is, what is good? And in particular, who decides what is good? Does the, do the people decide what is good? Or do political parties decide what is good? And I'm not just talking about the Communist Party in China. But I'm talking about political parties in a representative democracy to whom we delegate choices. And I think that this question matters because indeed I share the water gentleman in Germany concern that in Russia it takes very little to do procurement and in Europe much more. A second question has to do again with a sentence by Evgeny who said we have to look at the whole issue from start to finish and then for him, the start is the project initiation. But I'm puzzled because to me, one of the main problems with all this terrible data that McKinsey comes out with is the project approval stage. <coughs> and it's a quite political moment uh, with uh, many issues with demand overestimation, with the real cost estimation. And I wonder if you both had something to say about also this issue. Thank you. Sure, sure, very quick thing. Uh, first question is, I think, is rather political or political economic, and it's very, very little to do with the day-to-day -day business we run. But I, I firm believer, I, I would say I'm a liberal, so I believe that people have to decide what is good or what is bad. But unfortunately, in country I come in from, it sometimes uh, decided in the other way, so again by the most voted political parties. We can see discussions about Brexit in the UK, we can see all the discussion in the United States about the Trump election or re-election. So I think it's difficult because even when I say population, population is never have the same opinion. When it comes to procurement people, if you have procurement specialists in the room, you have four opinions. So it's actually even more complex. The same person may have different opinions at different time. And when we talk about substantial, substantial and sustainable infrastructure projects, they always have uh, multiple dimensions. And probably the best approach to find Pareto optimal, as you economists like, balance between different interesting factors. But probably it is highly unlikely that we will be able to satisfy expectation of every party concerned, unfortunately. It would be great, but as I mentioned again, since you started quoting me, I will be mentioning another quote for and said, try to make it a win-win situation for all, then most probably the project will be successful. Uh, second question, maybe I would like to add something to the first one, and then I will come to the second. Um. I have the same reflection on uh, what is sustainable, or well, sustainable what is, is what is good. Well, what is good, but the same applies to what is sustainable. And, uh, and that's from a scientific view, from a point of view, from a political point of view, might be from an economic point of view, from the survival of, of human beings on Earth point of view, etc. And I don't think that a procurement specialist should have that or uh, uh, any, any public buyer, anybody uh, active in procurement should have at least in mind 
that a procurement has to do something with sustainability and not only with the lowest price paid at the end. What that then means in detail, I do not think I'm qualified, and very few of us in the room are qualified to do that alone. We will need our, our um, specialists, our scientists, we will need our policy makers, and we will need our activists to help us define that. And then it's good if we manage. On the second question, uh, actually my lectures I show students of algorithmic curve. It's uh, how your ability to influence the project diminishes with time. In the beginning you can really shape it well, but further down the timeline you uh, get engaged with the project, the less influence you have. That's why I think that we shared observation of planning, 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 if you like, or from the conception moment we need to be involved in the project structure, well, understanding what potential risks we will have to deal with in, in future. And coming to the cost estimate, I think it's, uh, there is no golden solution how to uh, find the best cost estimate. Of course, with digitalization of public procurement, we have uh, more data, and this data may help us to make more fact-based decisions, uh, but still, uh, the markets develop, products change, modified, modernized, advanced. Um, when it comes to works contracts, the cost estimate based on assumptions of designers, consultants, and in real life, we, we dealing with real contractors who have their own structure, management structure, portfolio, risks, uh, approach mechanism, appetite and arrangements, markets, everything influences it. I think the key, key point is not to brood too much or argue too much what methodology for cost estimate is the best, but rather how to live with the available cost estimate. I think one of the biggest problems around the world, cost estimates are taken as a uh, written stone. And it uh, leads us to many problems. In many countries which are represented here, the most common process for procurement are reverse uh, auctions, electronic auctions, or tenders where the price is announced and if the price suddenly comes higher than announced one, tenders are cancelled, which I found uh, hands wrong because only market can tell you if you believe in Adam Smith in this invisible kind of market. The, I think the aim of procurement is to arrange and maintain high level of competition and market itself will even out what the real price for the given, reasonable price for the given uh, product or works is, or concession if you like, or services. So I think the discuss shall be shifted from how to de uh, uh, define the cost estimate, budget price, the <laughs> highest possible estimate, towards how to live with it. What to do if price is higher than that, lower than that, that is where, from my perspective, the, uh, the discussion should, should be. Um, let me add another idea of the project approval stage. Uh, often I don't think it's the cost which makes project approval difficult and that's why I uh, put so much emphasis about talking to civil society, talking to the stakeholders outside sorry, the procurement bubble about the approval of a project because this, there is political approval that's of high importance and that is indeed very much part of the procurement process and should be part of those people who procure, that they engage with not only with the market but with all the stakeholders, especially later the users, the neighbours, the uh, other political groups, etc. and do not, as I said, jump projects on the people. So yes, for me, the project approval stage is a very important stage. I wouldn't say it's before or after the project initiation, but um, that's an important step. Hello, everyone. I'm Catherine Frauscher. I'm with the Open Contracting Partnership. I'm Austrian, but I grew up in northern Italy in the region that you mentioned that is trying to build a tunnel to connect Austria to Italy. So I. Um, definitely can attest that tunnels in mountains between countries are, are very important. Um, my question, I love all the things that you're mentioning here. We at the partnership really believe that, you know, in procurement, politics matter, 
um, engaging civil society and vendor uh, really matter. One thing that you have both talked less about is the, the power of open data and information because I absolutely agree that um, talking to civil society and talking to vendors is important, but one way of making it easier and more systematized is by having open data, not just about the, the tender process that you mentioned before that the European Commission is uh, republishing centrally across the Union, but actually having that information all the way from tender to award to information. And have you seen mega infra infrastructure projects somewhere that are doing this systematically, that are sharing information in open, easy ways um, so that vendors or citizens can use that information to hold the builders accountable. Um, I absolutely agree with you, and I knew that you would be speaking, so I didn't want to talk, talk about anything you will be presenting to the public later anyway, and in much better form than I ever could. No, I don't. I remember how I don't know of any. You would be also much better placed to know about, about such projects. Um, I do remember once a project that was presented as an OE, at an OECD conference, where at least there was a clearer data-driven engagement of a society throughout the project cycle, where quite a, quite a lot of what was done in in the implementation of the infrastructure project, were put out there could be could be verified, could be questioned, could be commented on throughout the process. But I would have to go back to uh, my personal archives to find out where it was. To be already believe that openness is critical for overall as a public institution as more than that. Right? And we support cost initiative, which is also based on CPV work with open contract data. We understand the benefits of it. We also understand certain risks. And I think we will discuss it later as well. There is now such a position of Catherine. We didn't want to uh, step into your garden, which we have a few space to talk. Um, uh, but I have to say that uh, what we learned, and we started a few technical assistance program where we engage with civil society, we need to teach people how to work with this data. We can disclose all the data, but we may be absolutely useless if people don't know how to work with them. And that's where we need to help, because sometimes it, it, it may work counterproductive. As an example, but open data, which is not proper open data, because open data is machine readable, we understand the, the fundamental concept of it, but uh, you know, for example, a few years ago in Bulgaria there was a uh, firm requirement from the Chamber of Accounts uh, that data shall be published, not on the people who scan it in, in PDF. There are ocean of garbage, not information but garbage. We need to have data as information which we can work with. We need to teach civil society, teach public, every citizen shall understand what this data means. And also we shall be very uh, careful that Civil society and public probably shall raise flags, but not take final decisions. It shall be left to professionals. But let's discuss it when your presentation is done.